So now that we're done with the material on foundations of Java functional programming, method references, lambda expressions, functional interfaces, and so on, we're ready to start focusing on the really interesting parts of the next portion of the course, which is going to be discussing Java streams. And we'll start out with an overview of what streams are and a brief summary of some of the benefits you can expect by learning how the streams framework is designed. So the purpose of this discussion is to give you a better understanding of the structure and functionality of Java streams, focusing initially on the fundamentals of streams, what the building block pieces are, how they connect together, and then also summarizing what the payoff is for learning these concepts and, and uh, features. So Java streams are a framework that was first introduced into the Java class library in Java 8. So if you go and take a look at what's new in JDK 8, which came out in March of 2014 or so, one of the things they have here under collections, which is kind of a funny place to put it, is this concept of the Java util stream package, which as it says here, provides a stream API to support functional style operations on streams of elements. And they say that the stream API is integrated with the collection API, and we'll talk a lot more about that shortly, which enables bulk operations on collections, such as being able to do various kinds of map reduce operations, either sequentially or in parallel. Now, uh, this particular approach was a pretty radical step forward in Java relative to what had been there before, and it only made sense because they had built in the foundational features we talked about before, like uh, lambda expressions and method references and functional interfaces. Since Java 8, there's been other stuff that's been added to streams, although the bulk of what was there was there in Java 8. They've added a few extra operations, a few more bits and pieces, but it's, it's all pretty much there. And uh, I highly recommend this book, Modern Java in Action, which describes both what was in Java 8 and also what has come henceforth in Java. So what is a stream? A stream is basically a pipeline of aggregate operations that process a sequence or a flow of elements, which are sometimes called values or data. And also, in many cases, they're objects, although we tend not to think too much about what flows through a stream as objects, for reasons that will become a little bit clear, more clear later on. So with that as kind of the background, what is an aggregate operation? An aggregate operation is a so-called higher order function that applies a behavior parameter to every element in a stream. And higher order function is just a kind of a fancy way of saying a function that takes a function or a function that returns a function and so on. So aggregate operations are higher order functions. So you can see that we have these aggregate operations. They're joined together so that the output of one operation becomes the next put, the input into the next aggregate operation. And one of the things that's passed in as the parameter to the aggregate operation is something called the behavior. And the behavior, as we'll see in a second, is going to be something that allows behavior parameterization. Why do we do behavior parameterization? Because it makes it easier to cope with changing requirements. You can change what the computations do, but the overall structure of the stream from a software point of view is very similar. OK, um, conceptually, a stream is unbounded. You could have a stream kind of like a, like a video stream. If you think about a video stream coming off of a camera, um, you could have a stream of video or something that's you know, being downloaded from some source. Then it conceivably, it goes on forever. But of course, in practice, there are usually bounds or constraints that limit the amount of information in a stream. And that's usually things like you know, you're taking an existing collection, like a list of objects or a map of something, and you're turning it into a stream, and there was a finite number of elements in the collection to begin with. So you don't end up with an infinite stream if the source only has a finite size. So we'll talk, we'll talk a lot more about stream sources here in a second. But you can kind of think of a stream as like a flow of something, kind of like a video stream, although it's not obviously video in all the, all the circumstances. That's just an example. OK, we're going to use a particular case study throughout this introduction section just to be able to be concrete about what we're discussing. And the particular example is going to take a stream of characters, 
from the play Hamlet, and it's going to filter out anybody whose name doesn't start with a uppercase or lowercase h, and then we're going to capitalize all the names that have an uppercase or lowercase h so they all have a consistent capitalization form. We're going to sort them so they're sorted in ascending order, and then for each of the elements that survive the filtering and has, have been correctly capitalized, consistently capitalized, and have been sorted, we're going to print their results out. So that's the example that we'll see throughout this discussion. And uh, you can find this code here in the EX12 folder in my GitHub account. So what are the benefits of streams? So there's a couple different benefits that streams provide to programs and to programmers. I'll discuss them briefly, and then, of course, as we go through the various more concrete discussions of all the different parts of a stream, the different kinds of aggregate operations, the intermediate operations, the terminal operations, the data sources, and so on, you'll get a chance to see these benefits more concretely. So one of the things that Streams buys for us is they're very declarative. They focus on what, not how. So if you think about what declarative programming means, it means focusing on the computations you want to perform as opposed to how you need to perform them. So it's about the, the what, not the how, and, and things are very concise. You'll see here, um, this is a stream we'll talk about later. We have a stream of, of uh, URLs. We filter out URLs that we've already seen. We download the URLs that we haven't seen, and then we apply image processing filters to them, and we collect them all into a list. So you don't have to really focus on the details of the computations themselves. You just focus on how you combine the computations together in a pipeline. And we'll talk more about pipelines in a second. One of the key things to notice in this simple example is that there are no Java control flow operations here. You don't see a for loop. You don't see an if statement. You don't see a switch statement. You don't see anything that, that looks like a control flow element in Java. And that means you can read the code, once you know the syntax, you can read it from sort of top to bottom in a linear fashion, and you just see it as a progression or a series of transformations. So that is arguably simpler than having to loop back around and try to remember what the if statements do and so on and so forth. OK, so that's one set of benefits, concise and readable. Another benefit is flexibility. Functions, or these aggregate operations, are automatically composed together such that the output from one operation becomes the input into the next one. So just as a simple example, the output from filter serves as the input to map. The input to map then is processed. The output of map is, serves as the input to flat map, and so on and so forth. So that's pretty cool. You can just kind of link these things together like, like Lego or building blocks or something. And then the third key benefit of streams is scalability. And in particular, what you can do with a stream is you can go from something that's a sequential stream, like this example with the stream factory method here, to parallel stream. And that will go from having one thread of control, which is what we have if we have a single threaded stream or a sequential stream, to what's called a parallel stream. And in a parallel stream, there's actually multiple threads of control. And those multiple threads of control will work on different parts of the input from the data source and run them all in parallel. And then when everything's done, it'll collect them all back together again. So this is a classic example of the mode of parallel computing we talked about a week or two ago with respect to map reduce or split apply combine. If you remember that discussion we had before, where you take an input source, you break it up into small pieces, you run those pieces in parallel, and then you combine or join the results back at the end. So we'll talk a lot more about that when we get to the next part of the course, which focuses on parallel streams. Right now, we're just focusing on the streams framework in general, and we'll start out largely dealing with sequential streams. Yes, sir. Great question. So the question is, are there multiple threads behind the scenes? Absolutely. So if you see this diagram, uh, so here's the sequential stream. This is the one that we, you would get out of the box if you just say stream. And in that case, there's only one thread, and it's, it's whatever thread is is where the stream is being created, or actually more specifically, wherever the, the stream is being run. So let's say, for sake of argument, that's the main thread. When you use parallel streams, there's actually a pool of threads. And in the background, 
there is something that's called the common fork join pool. We will talk later in the course about what a fork join pool is. You'll see fork join pool is this really cool thing that's used to allow a pool of threads to take maximal advantage of the underlying multi-core processor that the program is running on. And the fork join pool has all kinds of cool features. It's got this thing called work stealing that we'll talk about. It's got very sophisticated algorithms to make it as efficient as possible and um, does really neat stuff. So under the hood, there's a common fork join pool, which is actually a singleton, if you remember the singleton pattern from the Gang of Four book, if you took CS251 here. And so the fork join pool is a singleton, the common fork join pool is a singleton, and that's all managed behind the scenes for you by, by the Java, um, the Java runtime class library. So the Java class library has a runtime system, and it will spawn these threads in the background. So you don't actually have to do anything. So if you recall our discussion we had from last week when we talked about that um, simple example of searching the works of Shakespeare in parallel to try to find uh, phrases, and I showed you how you had to explicitly spawn threads by, by basically creating the threads and then uh, starting the threads and then joining the threads and all that stuff. One of the cool things about streams and especially parallel streams is that all the thread management totally disappears. You don't have to worry about thread management pretty much at all. There's some, some subtleties we'll get to later if you really need to know how to work with it, but out of the box, it's not a, something you have to worry about. So yes, the answer is it manages it for you, and under the hood, it's creating threads. And those threads that are created under the hood are called worker threads. And we'll talk about worker threads later when we get to the, the fork join pool in more detail. But yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so that's kind of a summary of the benefits that you get with the uh, streams. As you can see here, one of the cool things is that we can, <laughs> excuse me, we can use the streams framework to automatically map these threads of control to the processor cores. So the threads are created uh, by the fork join pool framework under the hood, and then these threads are magically mapped by the Java virtual machine and the underlying operating system kernel and so on to the processor cores. And assuming that all goes well, then you get this transparent speed up with pretty much no effort on your part other than changing stream to parallel stream. There are obviously some subtleties, but we'll get to those later. But in the majority of the cases, if you have a lot of work to do, or a lot of samples, a lot of data to work on, and a lot of work to perform per sample, you can end up with a really nice speed up without having to do a whole lot of extra programming. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so that's a summary of Java streams. Needless to say, we're going to go to a heck of a lot more detail about how this stuff works. And it's also uh, a quick summary of the benefits. A reminder, these are the kinds of questions that tend to show up on quizzes, like name and describe three benefits of Java streams. You can almost guarantee that that'll be on a quiz 